At Mason's Heritage, located on Maryland's eastern shore, we grow certified organic corn, soybeans, and small grains. Our operations philosophy draws from sustainable agronomic, environmental, and economic viewpoints. Simply put, land stewardship is an investment in regenerative practices focusing on water quality, soil conservation, and soil health. This farm is dedicated to rejuvenating the soil ecosystem. We stimulate the soil microbiome by introducing biological inoculants that restore soil diversity and begin to reverse degradation done by years of tillage. However, soil amendments alone are not enough. Regenerative soil products must be complemented by best management practices. To sustain this strategy, living covers and the roots work in harmony. The farm's rigorous cover crop program follows a simple idea. Treat your cover crops like your cash crops. Our no-till soybean acres rely on the successful implementation of fast-growing, high-biomass annuals like cereal rye and crimson clover. The combination of the two species takes advantage of their symbiotic niches, becoming more than the sum of its parts. One hallmark of organic farming is growing fertility for cash crops, up to 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre. This means over half of a corn crop's needs can be produced by legumes. Historically, this green manure has been plowed under, which uproots the soil, damages its structure, oxidizes carbon stores, and releases CO2. Conventional tillage means more passes through the field, thus using additional fuel, increasing equipment costs, and advancing soil decline. Our strip-till equipment combines modern conservation methods with old-fashioned farming techniques. Soil disturbance occurs directly in the planting row while leaving the space between untouched. This worked strip allows the soil to dry and warm up for ideal planting conditions. The intact cover crop mix between rows continues growing, providing a mulch to control weeds and a green manure to fertilize the crop. Overall, the tillage intensity is reduced by two thirds and fuel consumption is cut by almost three quarters. And when maximizing a cover crop's potential, you have to up your residue management game. Our specialized equipment can handle the heaviest growth to yield the best results. We look to our heritage to glean lessons to adapt and adopt practices for a changing world. Our legacy will be teaching lessons and skills to be carried forward by the next generation. We are rooted in sustainable agriculture. We are growing our resilience. We are cultivating our future. We strive to do better. Good morning and welcome to Mason's Heritage. My name is Stephen Krzyzewski and I'd like to walk you through our philosophy, our farming philosophy here at our, on our organic grain operation in Queen Anne, Maryland. Our vision for what our farming system is becoming, where it's come from and where it's going. So just a little bit of farming background. This is a fifth generation farm. And I'd like to say we're cultivating the sixth generation. Our son, William, and our daughter, Rosa, it'll be put into their capable hands uh, sometime in the future. And just really quickly, give you an idea, but this farm's, uh, uh, the history of this farm has a little background, it used to be a livestock dairy, it used to be a lot of rotation, hogs and a lot of animals, hogs, horses, of course, the dairy cows, uh, fowl, even turkeys, extended, more diverse op uh, an operation as it was, had grain, had silage, rotational forage, so that would be hay, so it could be grass or alfalfa, and those are all in rotation and longer rotation. So what they call sustainable rotations now, sustainable farming, regenerative farming. It was just called farming in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. And once the dairy was sold, we moved on to cash crops. They kind of followed the local trends. Um, corn and soybeans were the primary crops and a lot of custom farming for other farmers in the neighborhood, which could be probably in a 10 mile radius. Uh, and then in the late 70s to 80s, focused on vegetables, local canneries, there was a, created a demand for peas and sweet corn and spinach and beans. And some of the first irrigation systems on this farm were installed then. And then came the advent of prescription farming with the Roundup Ready Row Crops. And we'll get to speaking about that in just a few slides. So very simply, the way I see conventional row crop production is you're looking at apply, deplete, rinse, and repeat. And what that basically means is you're locked into some kind of fertility welfare, a, a one-way street. And there's really no diverse, um, other, other diverse pathways where you can go. You have to put everything into the system and then pull everything out and basically then just sterilize that system for the next crop, whether it might be the same crop again or just a uh, different crop. So if it was corn one year, 
you just grow your corn, you put in what you need, you take it off in the harvest, you have this mass balance going on, very simple, and then you sterilize it, wipe the slate clean, and go on with the next crop. It's just really a means to an end, designed to homogenize that environment, and you're really just minimizing the diversity. And um, a lot of this prescription agriculture, as I call it, really relies on a reactive approach rather than a proactive approach. So instead of looking at the causes, you're just treating the effects. And a lot of these managements, you know, focused on in terms of pests anyway, looking at eradication, zero pests, nothing at all. Whereas an organic system, we want to try to control pests and actually manage them. Uh, we're looking to suppress pests and tolerate them to a certain extent. And all the too many chemical cocktails out there and the fate in the environment is very poorly understood. Um, and I do would like to just point out that some gains have been made over the years with minimum, minimum and vertical tillage, just working the ground very lightly, which has built the soil uh, organic matter and improved the soil condition. And participation in our state's cover crop program has been helping a lot of these farmers, I think, start to glean some of the lessons that I'm trying to convey here in this presentation. Uh, but still, there's too many farmers, I think, that get rid of any uh, cover crop potential, which is something we rely heavily on in our, our farming system. So our philosophy boils down to, I think, three main pillars. First pillar is better nutrient mal uh, management or med uh, balance, that is. So we're trying to grow our fertility. So we're trying to use legumes and we're trying to stimulate the soil. We're trying to space our mineralization out. We're not trying to do all of our work at once and try to grow a single crop uh, during the course of the season. We're trying to diversify and, like I said, stagger our planting season throughout the entire month of May. And hopefully that's also gonna help us reduce any imports we bring in on the farm like poultry litter, which is uh, another way we supplement the fertility for our crops like the corn. Second, we'd like to reduce tillage. We're trying to save time, money, and soil. Every farmer really wants to do that. We think we can do it without any conventional chemicals or those other methods uh, that i mentioned in the previous slides. The one thing we have to remember though, is our field practices have to be compatible with soil health practices. And thirdly, our cover cropping. It's got to be purposeful. It's got to address a certain concern we have, whether it's weeds, whether it's fertility, maybe it's both, maybe it's timing. It's got to be purposeful. It's got to be targeted. So that staggered fertility, like I mentioned, and we're trying to treat those cover crops like our cash crops. So we're trying to put just as much attention towards those cover crops like we do the corn and the soybeans that we're growing for our, our bumper crops. Uh, and that living roots equal living soil. And we'll get to those slides here shortly. When we're growing our fertility, you look at this picture here, we can grow up to 70 to 90 pounds of our PAN, that's plant available nitrogen. That is the nitrogen that the plant has available to take up that season. That's roughly half. And usually about the uh, first week in May, that cover crop is ready. It's mature. You can see in this picture, it's flowering. It is almost ready to be terminated. This field, for example, though, will be plowed. It will be turned over. Um, but instead of just bringing all the fertility in, either with poultry litter or um, organic products, which we do, we do have available to us in a very, very expensive, this is a very cheap way of doing it. It's about the cheapest source of nitrogen that uh, we can put out there in our fields, roughly a dollar a pound, actually. Only challenge here is the monoculture that we have. It offers little flexibility during the termination period at the beginning of the month and through the rest of the planting season in May. So moving on to growing fertility 2.0. So what we're trying to do is coordinate the cover crops niche with the planting schedule. So we're still sticking with those annual legumes. So we're using the top picture there, you see vetch. You can see how tall it is. Look at the amount of growth there. And the bottom, there's peas mixed in with some rye. Um, so the hairy vetch and the peas are two viney crops. And what we really like about them, once they do mature, they can keep growing. They can keep producing more nitrogen. We don't have to be right there, ready to, to either plow it under or no-till it or strip-till it, whatever method we're doing for our corn crop. Uh, right away, we have flexibility now. We widen our window of opportunity to do something. And they can even produce more nitrogen, 80 to 100 pounds of plant available nitrogen for our crop. It's a big savings on buying more imports. I just want to highlight a few things in this screen. This is for our, our reduced tillage program with our no-till soybeans. We'll just compare like, for example, conventional till corn on the top, that red box, and look at all the operations we have to go through 
to get that field ready to plant. And look at the bottom. You're looking at a much smaller number of operations. So you're saving that time, that money, uh, fuel. You're also that saving that soil. And we're working the ground far, far less. When it comes to more of our reduced tillage, we're trying different methods with, with uh, corn, strip till corn. So like I mentioned, instead of plowing the entire soil profile over, turning it all over and working it multiple times, we're trying to run one or two passes to do all those, to, uh, to do all those steps, to minimize those steps. And also I said, we're trying to save conventional corn, 4.5 gallons an acre, strip till corn, one gallon an acre for that early spring season field fitting. We can get out there in wet weather. We have roots between the passes, between the rows that are still intact. We can drive on those after rains, maybe not right after, but we can certainly access the field sooner than a completely plowed uh, field, which just becomes muddy and has to dry out. And it does so more slowly. And we disturb less, only a eight to, eight to 10 inch swath in that planting zone. So we have the 20 inches. This is a 30 inch center row. One row of plants is here, 30 inches over here is the other. So we only worked eight to 10 inches and we got 20 inches of, of undisturbed uh, plant, uh, undisturbed cover crop that we leave untouched, two thirds less disturbance. And here's the one and done machine, combines all those other operations, the plowing, the disking, the field cultivating, and even the, the harrows to smooth out the ground. This machine is a one and done, a one pass tool. I think more broadly, when you think we think of reduced tillage, or I'd like you to think of tillage, is think of the infrastructure, the highway infrastructure of this country, kind of an analogy. So, you know, a healthy soil is like a healthy economy. It depends on interconnected networks or infrastructure. Just look at the map of the U.S. highway system and road system on the left versus the mycorrhizal fungal network on the right. A lot of similarities there. That's what we're going for. When you have a deteriorated and broken infrastructure, which tillage would do to the soil, you require more of those inputs to keep the economy going. It's gonna struggle, but the, all that efficiency and productivity and resiliency of that economy depends on those interconnected links, that network, that web. And mentioning purposeful cover cropping, targeted cover cropping, our old model kind of focused on uh, the mono species, mono purpose was just that crimson clover. It worked well, but it created problems. It was a logistical logjam. We'd have problems with the weather. We'd get to work in terminating the cover crop and we'd have to use more equipment. We'd have to disc it down then we'd have to plow it. And plus, or, you know, we'd get interrupted by something, a breakdown and everything have to stop. Uh, we'd have fertility losses. We might get started planting, plowing, then the rain comes, we have to just let it sit and dry out then. There's really nothing else to do, no other corn to plant. It's all the same. It's all in the same boat. Uh, we have the extra operation, operations sometimes after we do plow some fields. We're covering about 500 acres roughly every year. We'll have to stop somewhere and a field that's been plowed, the flush of weeds comes up. You have to manage that. You can't let them go out of control. You can't just till them down and plant over top of them. It doesn't work like that. So it's much more resilient. We can achieve that balance of what the end production we need and the weed suppression by mixing species. So mixing the rye, which shades weeds, we can plant peas, which grows our fertility. We can have greater biomass and greater, I said, I mentioned redundancy uh, in the system. And we're experimenting also with rapeseed. We're adding that to try to control some of our, our grass problems in our no-till soybeans right now. So canola or rapeseed, it uh, has a taproot, which uh, penetrates the soil, alleviates any compaction, adds a tough biomass armor, we also like to call it, for better weed control, and also has a lot of flowers to attract local natural pollinators. So what we're trying to invest in with our soil is we're trying to build something. We're trying to build a reservoir and not a drain. We want to pool our nutrients, our water, our carbon. We're not a lot of conventional production, although they've made some gains, they've kind of hit a plateau right now. What they're putting in is basically what's coming out. There's no life in the soil. There's nothing they're really depositing anymore in that soil. And we know we can sink a lot more carbon in the soil we have right now. I think of that as a soil savings account. Um, it's a really kind of about a word I, or term I've coined as a fiscal fertility. Uh, you're trying to keep all those nutrients in one place and have them available at any time and have them easier to access by the crop. And plus it's a lot more efficient. When you see this picture on the bottom, which do you think extracts nutrients from the soil better? the left half of that image or the right half of the image with all the networks and the mycorrhizae of fungi and pathways and diversity that you see. That's what we're really going for. 
what what does what are we putting into the soil? What are we building in the soil? When we talk about you know build my soil, we're, well, it's really both, mostly about a lot of these humic acids, these huge large molecular compounds. They're huge carbon carbon hydrocarbon chains. They bind and release nutrients. They buffer and stabilize the pH, means we don't have to lime as often. They form this spongy network that can store and hold on to water much more efficiently than just any standard soil particles, your sand, your clay, or your silt particles. Resists compaction, you can drive over it and it just doesn't compress, it kind of bounces back. It's resilient. And it gives a, a one thing, I, a little, be a little uh, technical here. Well, I wanted to mention the cation exchange capacity. That's just thinking like, how many parking spaces do you have for your nutrients to bind? Sand is very, very low, which our soil is mostly consists of sand, two to 10 mill equivalents, clay, much higher, 25 to 100. But when you talk about organic matter, the stuff we're trying to build with these humic acids, we're talking 250 to 400 mill equivalents. That's enormous. I wanted to put the slide in quickly just to show that we don't have to buy an entire array of different equipment to do this planting the equipment. You see the tractor and the planter there in the bottom left. That is a tractor and planter that can plant and use for any situation. You can use in tilled ground, you can use in no-till ground, minimum till, strip till. It's all just about certain little components that need to be added. It's very simple. It's fairly cheap. Really the planter that you need is already in your shed. It's about making small modifications. You don't have to have this huge capital investment in equipment. And it's about adding certain little pieces of the toolkit. We call our toolkit with certain cultivators, high residue cultivators. They don't work the ground. They save soil. Uh, flamer, not working the ground at all. We burn the weeds or even have a weed zapper now, which actually electrocutes the weeds in the soybean fields. Anything that sticks up above the soybeans, we zap them. So we do have a lot of these alternatives available. All it's about is managing the biomass you see on the picture on the right, you can see we have soybean plants coming up. We have to go a little slower. We have to be a little more careful, but it's certainly possible. We've been doing it for several years now and we like the results. What do these cover crops, or what are we trying to combat here? Well, anthropogenic impacts, human caused problems. So the weather or the climate, like I had mentioned before, we wanna access our fields sooner following rain events. We wanna widen our window of opportunity in the field. So instead of having only maybe we have a rain event and then we have two or three good days of drying before the next rain's coming, we can want, we can use more of those days in between to do something rather than not doing anything at all or squeezing something in and not doing a very good job. We've given ourselves more flexibility. We're trying to disrupt pest cycles. Um, in, uh, integrated pest management focuses on the pathogen, host, and environment triangle. If you di can dis disrupt one of those pillars of the, the pest's influence, you're gonna, you're gonna affect that pest. So we're trying to affect its environment. So with cover crops, when we're shading the ground using the high biomass um, cover crops we've grown with the rye, the crimson clover, and we roll it over, we're shading the ground from sunlight and we're reducing the soil temperature right off the bat. Those are two pillars of the favorable environment that the, that the weed host really needs. We can disrupt that cycle we can give our crops an advantage and give them the edge. We're also trying to restart nutrient cycling. So our nitrogen, our phosphorus, the carbon, and even the hydrologic cycle or water cycle. Um, we're trying to create all these different pathways and diversity, these macro pores for water flow. And what we actually see is a cycle, it's a system in the soil. Instead of just putting in and taking out, we're cycling things, we're storing things, we're creating that reservoir. And what it all has been boiling down to lately for us is hedging our bets on climate. We're gonna be living in a warmer, wetter, and wilder world. So we're trying to reduce our crop stress. Uh, we're trying to uh, deal with these, uh, this more rainfall, this cover crop, keeping that armor on the ground. We're trying to get out in that field. If we have something sitting on the ground and just bit, rather than bare soil, we'll be able to access that field and get the crops planted and make a living off the land. And when we're talking about wilder, you know, all these extremes. So these, these weather windows, of, as I've mentioned, they can be very tight. They can be very sporadic. What we can do with our cover crops and our reduced tillage and our different uh, fertility regime is we can combat all these anthropogenic human caused, human caused uh, effects on our world. That's what we're trying to accomplish here. And that really uh, says it all for me. And I have a little information here if, with any questions or comments or chit chat, you can always contact me. And I also just wanted to leave you with two quotes that I always turn to. 
and it steals my will when things maybe aren't going so right out there. The first is a quote by Einstein. He said, and I'm paraphrasing, of course, he says, the definition of insanity is trying the same thing over and over and expecting different results. And the second one is, it is the learners who inherit this earth and it's the learned who are prepared for a world that no longer exists. And that's what I try to base my philosophy on here at Mason's Heritage. So uh, thank you for your time. And thank you to M Penn for the opportunity to talk to you. Thanks.